Ladies and gentlemen, it's Friday morning. It's Gateway Office Hours. We are live here at Gateway Works. I'm Ben Larson, co-founder of Gateway. And believe it or not, my co-founder is also here, Carter, but he's behind the ones and the twos over there in the back. And I'm here with a couple special guests, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Just like every other Friday, we're here live on Facebook and we are... Yeah, talking about cool stuff that's going to help your business get to the next level. Answering your questions, send them in. Make sure Luke, Michael, Princessa, Carter, don't message me. I'm not going to get it. Anyways, if you missed this, we are live, or not live, on recording on YouTube and all the other sources where you get your podcasts and whatnot. Anyways, I'm just going to keep moving along. I am here. I didn't quit. There are some people that thought I might have left Gateway, but we were just joking. So don't be so gullible. Um, and yeah. I did have people last, I did have people come to me home like, I, I, I did have people email me saying like, oh, uh, that guy who used to be running Gateway, what's going on? <laughs> I didn't even know your name. Yeah. <laughs> that guy? Really? That's yeah. all I get? Okay. Yeah. I, I, did, I didn't leave Gateway. I'm still running it. Um, Carter's helping. Um, I've, I've just uh, <laughs> lost my corporeal form. Yeah. So I'm still Which is here. great. <laughs> awesome. Well, I am here with our special guest today from Anresco, Isaac and Vu. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, lab work in the cannabis industry and mm -hmm. beyond and its importance and how it's playing a key pivotal role um, as this industry grows and comes into the mainstream. Um, but before we get there, I just wanted to chat really quick, like we do every week, awkwardly, is insert a few, a uh, couple news items here and just, uh, I don't know, maybe there's not a lot to talk about. Uh, We've got at least four points. We do, because they aren't written on a board directly behind the camera. Um, so, number one, uh, Germany uh, is officially issuing new cannabis licenses. I think they quickly grew from like 500 to 1,000. And when you're in a country of 80 million, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or, or not, or not. But it's, uh, it's, it's going in the right direction. Right. They're, they're figuring it out. And, you know, as we talked about last show, it's, it's uh, very medically focused, which from a lab perspective is, is probably pretty interesting. You know, it's, uh, you know it's, a, it's a way to grow an industry with more confidence. Yeah, oh, definitely, um, definitely. Yeah. Um, Montana is also looking at their medical program. Uh, basically, it's on the governor's desk. Um, you know, hopefully signing that into... Uh, in soon, and that would, as I predicted, I think last week, Carter, uh, our thirtieth state, which would make it three fifths of the states have medical oh, programs. Yeah, you're yeah. so smart, Ben. I know. <laughs> 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 um, and then on this one, I actually have to read this one. On 420, the National District Attorneys Association issued a report recommending consistent enforcement of federal prohibition. Does someone want to chime in? What the hell that means? Like. That doesn't sound good. Well, I yeah, guess what is they're that? hoping to be consistent with their lack of enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, the white paper I can share out on the comment section, um, but it just says that uh, federal policy should be enforced uh, state to state, no matter what municipalities or states uh, would like to do themselves. Um, so that was the National District Attorneys Association and their recommendation officially on well, 420. I've uh, never heard of them, so they don't exist. Um, are you saying a bunch of lawyers say are, are recommending that we oh, use job security? For stuff? Job security? Wow. Go figure. I wonder okay. what the prison guard unions say about drug laws. Right, yeah. Oh, the private prisons. Yeah, they should be in bed together. Oh, wait, they probably are. Um, anyways, moving on. This is great. <laughs> this is what happens when Carter doesn't uh, run the show. Okay, Philadelphia mayor You should calls. see how horrible I'm <laughs> switching videos back here, too. I'm in the worst producer ever. Yeah, and we're going to put I'm Luke really back hating. in the driver's yeah. seat pretty soon. Luke, this is, the, this is um, a clusterfuck. You can hop over this way. Okay. <laughs> Philadelphia mayor calls for legalization after 22 people were arrested in raid. Um, great. A, a little bit after the fact. Um, it's great that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess it's better to have the mayor on your side. Yeah, I don't know. True. Why not? <laughs> this is a weird news week. Okay. Well. Good. Stuff happened. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a news reporter, so let's just move <laughs> on to the fun stuff. Um, sure. You know, like I was saying, well, we, we can dive into this. Um, you know, I'll just ask you questions about, like, where is the, the, the lab industry at right now? Why, sure. You know, I've, uh, I've heard a lot from, like, product producers mm -hmm. going out and getting tests on, getting, like, different results from different labs and having it be very inconsistent. 
kind of just like, I don't know which one is the best to answer this, but like, <laughs> what is the current state of lab testing in the cannabis industry? And uh, where does Anresco sit kind of in that realm? So I guess the current state of the industry in terms of testing is probably what you would call infancy. Mm -hmm. um, even though there are labs that have been around, you know, doing testing for six, seven, eight years in the space, a lot of that, as Vu can attest to, is, you know, just internal R&D, mm. um, figuring out what standards you're going to, you know, use and just generally playing around with everything until you can figure out how to consistently right. do that. Yeah. Uh, so so the industry is emerging very quickly. Yeah. Sometimes the standards aren't being set by governing bodies, but more on the industry itself, like wanting to self-regulate. Is that is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. I mean, right now, I know there are no standards, mm -hmm. no regulations, no enforcement, nothing of any kind as it comes to labs. Right. And so you kind of end up with um, a bunch of labs trying to do their best and get it done right. And sometimes it's just not the case. You know, um, people aren't willing to pay a thousand dollars for a USP grade pharmaceutical potency test. Right. So people instead, you know, they're they're more thinking sixty, seventy five, a hundred dollars per test, and there's only so much the labs can do for that kind of um, capital, it's, or lack thereof. Right. Um, you know, when you're running instruments that are quarter of a million, half a million dollars with really experienced people that know what they're doing, yeah. um, you know, you're not exactly going through a drive-through getting a quick test result. But sure. there are some labs out there that, you know, could be two guys in a trailer printing out pieces of paper with good results because they know, you know, Producers love having good, fuzzy, happy results. Like, and you get 30% THC, yeah. and you get 30% yeah. yeah. THC, yep. right? Yeah. Um, okay, so there's there's a spectrum of, of quality when it comes to the labs. Yeah. There's the the new ones that are emerging, trying to serve this this important demand mm -hmm. that's in the cannabis industry, not yeah. only potency, but like what's in the cannabis. Yeah. Um, but Anresco has a little bit of a longer history, right? It's, yeah. Um, give us a little bit of color as to like when you guys started, what the focus has been, and, and kind of how the cannabis industry is changing the, the business that you're working in. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know I haven't been around 74 years. Um, right, yeah. But I mean, I was just going to say, you look great. <laughs> yeah, the cannabis, yeah. you know, really keeps me young. Uh, Man. It's, it's a good preservative. Okay. Um, no, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, and Resco came about in 1943. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it was a chemistry lab. Um, but since then, for the last 74 years, you know, we've been doing pharmaceutical, environmental, and food testing mainly. Okay. Um, and so most of our work was FDA detention import uh, work. So mm -hmm. basically the FDA detains certain imports that are flagged as high risk and forces them to use a third party private lab to test and make sure it's safe to consume. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's checking for melamine or filth and contaminants like rodent hairs or bug fragments mm -hmm. or pests pesticide or all sorts of good stuff. I know, you know, there are days we walk out of the lab like, I don't want to eat anything. Oh, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, no, so uh, ever since the end of Obama's administration, when people were kind of checking out in the beginning of Trump's administration, mm -hmm. uh, the FDA has seemed to be more worried about their jobs than doing their jobs. And so detained imports have gone down, mm -hmm. and thus... Well, A, more not tested stuff's coming into the country, which is kind of worrisome. Yeah. But um, B, uh, with that business going down and Resco kind of decided a couple of years ago, hey, there's this new emerging market. We could really help a lot of people out in offering our services because there aren't really any legitimate labs in the space that didn't just come about for the cannabis. Sure. So um, we've kind of seen crazy turnaround from when we started, I want to say fully last year. Um, it was made up, what, like one or two percent of our business. Now it's like 20, 30 percent of our revenue. Wow. Um, and that's only going up. It's just been yeah. snowballing ever since. Um, once people kind of found out there's this little lab in Bayview that knows what they're doing, yeah. uh, things have uh, things have kind of spiraled yeah. out. And, 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 and Vu, you are the scientist in the room. You're you're the one that's been doing the <laughs> testing. How long have you been doing the testing for? Uh, about 27 years. 27 Just years. Just a little bit older than me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Touch older. So it's, it's safe to say that you were fully doing lab work on food, FDA right. processes, and now 30% of what you do correct. is now cannabis? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Wow. Yeah. Tell me about that evolution. Like, what, what was that like, like, when cannabis started first getting introduced to, a, like, what you do and kind of, like, 
you know, now has it reached the level yet where it feels kind of like just de dealing with food and you guys have like the set processes and all that? It's yeah, we, we're working on, you know, setting up methods and procedures and get ourselves ISO certified for mm -hmm. all this uh, cannabis testing. Um, it's been difficult because even though we have done food for a long time, it's, it's, it's still new to us. We're still learning every single right. day. Um, we're learning from other labs have been in the business for a long time yeah. too. Um, you know, we pick up one little thing at a time and people have been very creative with cannabis testing and food and all that. Mm -hmm. So we had to find a way to make it right. Uh, so it's been challenging yeah. to get the thing done correctly. Um, so, you know, we're still in a learning process and we will continue to learn. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I mean, a big part of the industry and a growing part of the industry is, is the edibles industry. Yeah. Right. So that kind yeah. of bridges the gap and kind of fits right into your wheelhouse. Are there, I mean, there's not a lot of regulations out there for the no. edibles market, no. which is weird because it is kind of food. And edibles technically aren't food or drugs. So what are they? Right. So yeah. <laughs> is there anyone that has took it upon themselves to like treat it as one or the other, like when they come to you? Um, I, or is it still just kind of like testing mostly for potency and, and you know, chemicals and whatnot? Um, well, I mean, since it, I know in the eyes of the government, it is food, neither food nor drug. So <laughs> it's kind of nothing. But I mean, in our eyes, it's still food. It just happens to have mm -hmm. this one added ingredient. Sure. And so what we do is we treat it as such. You know, we still homogenize it, sample prep it the same way. Then the question is just now we're looking for cannabinoids rather than just doing nutritional labeling or a shelf right. life study or yeah. water content. That or, makes way too much sense. Like, yeah. why are you guys doing something that makes I, so much sense? We're logical, scientific <laughs> people. Um, <laughs> uh, some more scientific for him. But sure. um, yeah, uh, we've kind of been treating edibles the same way. I know a lot of labs charge more for edibles because it takes more solvent to actually test a lot mm. of those products. Mm -hmm. um, since we've been doing food testing for so long and we know what we're doing very well in that sense, uh, I think we have kind of a natural competitive advantage over a lot of those other labs. Sure. That said, um, we've seen a crazy array of edibles. I mean, I know we've got what, like a powdered tea, uh, tea bags, uh, cold brew coffee, um, topicals, tinctures. We've had a lubricant we've had, uh, which was edible. Of course. Okay, I was just gonna. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't gonna ask too many questions, but yeah. That was, okay. Yeah, no. Everyone, if, if if there's a product out there, we're seeing that people are just infusing it with cannabis. Someone mm -hmm. was telling us, you know, they brought us one of their products, which were, were edibles. They were, you know, just snacks, and they were like, oh yeah, well I might be back with a deodorant in a couple months. A deodorant. Yeah, mm -hmm. just because why not? You know, you put on your deodorant in the morning. Why, why not guess, have a yeah. buzz with it? I guess. Sure. You know. Uh, so no, it's kind of crazy. Um, if if you can put cannabis in it people seem to want to do it. Uh, Luke, can you find some cannabis deodorant for me? Yeah, give us a try. Um, <laughs> please, please. <Luke. laughs> yeah. Instead of Old Spice, you've got Mr. Nice deodorant. Right, yeah. Like that. So, yeah. So interesting. Um, you mentioned, and I can totally imagine, you know, I've worked in some food business and like going home at the end of the night not wanting to eat. But, yeah. you know, there's been some disconcerting stories in the news lately about contaminants causing mm -hmm. illness and mm -hmm. even worse in some cases yeah right. um like did that put you like on high alert when it comes to comes to testing because I, I guess there's a sense of ownership when something has come through your lab and you know it's like certain producers and um how are you balancing all that or just being extra careful and being very stringent with like how you operate with your customers i would say it's probably the m latter most thing mm -hmm. that you just mentioned i think i think when it comes to testing we uh we're a little bit different in a lot than a lot of the other labs out there in that we're not just testing something once, getting the result out the door, calling it a day. Yeah. Uh, I know these guys, you know, Vu and his team basically don't, you know, rest until they know they have an accurate answer or mm -hmm. result for something. So I mean, there have been times where we get something in, test it once. Oh, this doesn't look right. We should check this on another instrument. Let's rerun yeah. this. You know, uh, and they'll do this. You know anywhere from two to five times depending on what's going on mm -hmm. just because they want to make sure they get it right because you know everybody realizes that not only do people's businesses and entire livelihoods rest on our results but 
the end consumer's health as well. Yeah. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there have been stories in the news, uh, cancer patient smoked a flower, there was fungus in it, he had a compromised immune system, ended up with a fungal infection in his lungs, he couldn't fight and he perished, you know, he died back like a couple months ago and it was, yeah. it's crazy. It's one of the only deaths ever linked to cannabis, period. Mm -hmm. um, whether it was a direct result or not, you know, still up for debate, but yeah. um, when it comes to a lot of these products, there are compounds in them that people don't realize are in them because, you know, a lot of labs out there printing those happy fuzzy results aren't doing what they're supposed to do. You know, if a product isn't safe for consumption, that should be something that the producer should know, right. um, rather than you know kind of sticking your head in the sand and going with an ignorance is bliss route until 2018 when it's actually going to be enforced. Right. So can you talk about that a little bit? Like what what is going to happen in 2018? How can consumers be a little like you know rest assured that they're consuming something that is actually healthy? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the state uh, of California will supposedly or is supposed to have their regulations in place by January 1st, 2018, because that's when both recreational market begins mm -hmm. and also when standardization for the labs is supposed to happen. Okay. Um, so they will hopefully have a bar set, which will probably knock out some of the players in the game right now. Mm -hmm. um, I know we'll be fine. We, you know, we're as compliant as it gets. So that, um, I mean, that probably comes with the whole gamut of like having, having standards for how labs are set up and operated, having like secret shoppers where they're like doing different lab test results. Yeah. So that's the thing. Um, one thing Vu and I were actually talking about with the Department of Public Health a couple weeks ago was that ISO certification isn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. basically ISO is this accrediting body that oversees analytical labs um, or not just analytical labs, but other labs as well. Um, and will accredit those laboratories with the appropriate accreditation mm -hmm. when, if or when they're actually proved to have done what they've done. Um, so for us, you know, we have an ISO audit coming up in May. So once a year they come in, uh, they let us know when they're coming in. They audit the lab, look through all our books, make sure we're actually it's running what we're running, doing what yeah. we're doing. It's very predictable, exactly. So we were telling the Department of Public Health, we think there needs to be a second measure or a second step involved where there can be or would be random checks, just like you said, mm -hmm. secret shoppers or secret yeah. diners or whatever you want to call it, critics, reviewers, um, that would come in, you know, as some grower or some producer of something, um, get it tested and would actually have real results from an internal lab, whether it be the government's lab in Richmond, which mm -hmm. we've advised um, the CDPH on, um, or something else. But but um, there needs to be more than just an ISO accreditation where it's only being checked or audited once a year. Sure. Because 11 months out of the year, X lab could be doing whatever the heck they want. And then in that one month, just clean everything up and make it look like they've been doing what they're supposed to be doing. And ISO may or may not know the difference. Yeah. And so Vu, like how many, um, how many of these tests are going on in a given day at the lab? <laughs> like, I mean, is, is, are we talking like a large volume here? Yes. Because I, I'm imagining, you know, for every plant that's grown, how many samples are, are people doing? Because we all know that like the top of the plant is different than something from the bottom or the trim and, you know, extracts and edibles and all these different things. Like mm -hmm. you it's, guys must have your hands full. Yes, we, we're getting more and more samples than we probably can handle at this point. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, you know, in the process of hiring more people and, you know, buying more instruments. Yeah. For that, but we have a lot of sample going through. Um, how many we get in a day? It, it varies from day to day, to be sure. honest. Is we, we get like 30, 50. Yeah. And, um, that days we got 70 samples. Wow. Uh, okay. for, for different testing, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be pond seed, could be pond seed, pesticide, solvent. Residual yeah. solvents, yeah. Um, and it's, it, There's got to be this like kind of combination happening where you're testing for more and you're like following more of what's happening in the plant, but at the same time, hopefully building some efficiencies into the process and right. making the, hopefully driving those costs down just because, you know, like, it, I, I, I'm assuming that's what a large pushback from, from the producers are. Yeah. It's like, how am I going to afford to get all this product tested um, and have consistent results? You yeah. Know? Well, I mean, they can afford it. They just don't want to hurt their bottom line. I, I ah, think they get used to the point that you go <laughs> everywhere else and $120 for the full skim, you know, pesticide, yeah. solvent, yeah. potency, which for us is like, we can make it, you know, with that kind of money. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, we're running our <coughs> pesticide screens on what's called uh, LC mass spec triple quads, so mm -hmm. liquid chromatography instruments that cost anywhere from 400 and half a million dollars, uh, cost $70,000 a year per instrument to maintain. Wow. Just to maintain. Okay. Um, it's worse than my car. And we've got five of those. <laughs> and that's what we run our pesticides on. And I know uh, a couple of the other labs, you know, SC Labs, Steep Hill, CW, didn't have any of those until recently. And now they've each got one, maybe two. So mm -hmm. they're going to be figuring out and working with those. And I'm sure they'll, you know, find the kinks that we've been finding with that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, running a lab is a very capital intensive business. Mm -hmm. um, you're basically, you, you, your, your biggest assets are your people. Uh, and with Enresco, we've got, you know, seven section supervisors with 25 to 30 years experience each, and they don't come too cheap. Yeah. Um, that in cohesion with uh, all the instrumentation that we have, and then actually having a lab facility in San Francisco, which is, as you can imagine, not a very uh, low cost city to operate in. No. Um, you know, it adds up. And sure. right now we're priced higher than most of our competition, mainly due to our pesticide screens. Mm -hmm. That's because we're screening for 382 compounds. Everyone else is screening for under 100. Okay. Um, and that is really important, we think, to the industry simply because um, if a given farmer or producer knows, oh, here's a list of pesticides we're not mm -hmm. allowed to use. Let's just use something that's not on that list that no one's right. looking for. Yeah. And the safety, you know, quality as far as the consumer is concerned could technically be there yeah. from a lab report or a lab result. But if that lab's only looking for, you know, 20, 30, 40 pesticides, there's however many hundreds of thousands out there that, you know, could be used otherwise. This is so, I mean, this is such an interesting thing to me just because, like, it seems like, I don't know, maybe I'm just super paranoid. Um, I don't know how a lot of the other consumers are feeling right now, but like, are there people that are like, yeah, I'm going to get tested by Enresco and maybe I'll even put that on my packaging and be like, you know, like yes. Enresco certified or yeah. something like that. It's, yeah. uh, it seems kind of like important. And it's like, you know, did the t t tobacco industry go through this? Because you're, you know, it's, you're talking <laughs> about like, you know, a product that is farmed and then, yeah. you know, put into something that someone smokes. Sprayed so with like, a whole bunch of stuff, yeah. Right. Um, tobacco is interesting because they lobbied very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, so well, in fact, that they kind of bypassed a lot of stuff, especially after they weren't able to keep the whole cancer thing a secret anymore. Right, yeah, I guess if the pesticides aren't killing you, the product will. So. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, with tobacco, that kind of just streamlines that and you know freeways right by that issue for the most part uh, between the lobbying and the actual like oh well everyone knows this kills you it's just so damn addicting and good um but as far as you know cannabis is concerned um yeah i mean i know after we did testing for the hempcon show last august mm -hmm. i pretty much went home and just threw away my whole head stash because i was so freaked out at the results yeah. we found you know we were yeah, we were cool. seeing arsenic cyanide like all these intoxicants and poisons in small amounts and like some of these products and it was just like why is this here um and after we spoke with some of the uh entrants some of the people that were competing in that event uh they just didn't know they they had been getting good lab results back from whatever labs they had been using respectively and just said this is you know this is bullshit we've never seen this before carter right? remind me to short flower after the show <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah you know can i ask you a question yeah please this is my this, this disembodied voice from behind the camera. God. Uh, <laughs> what scares you the most in terms of uh, stuff that's maybe not, people don't know they're consuming right now, especially as uh, obviously the market grows? I think what scares yeah, me the most is people consuming untested product because mm -hmm. you just have no idea what could be in there. Um, but is there any particular, you know, fungal? Problems um, or systemic pesticide problems. I'd say and and pesticide pes both. pesticides. I say both. Pesticides and residual solvents probably the biggest, but also heavy metals. No one's is really looking. Right. No one's really looking at heavy metals. Um, and cannabis is a weed. You know, it is a weed plant, and it will take up anything and everything from the water and soil that it gets. So if your soil or your water source have any traces of arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, whatever else that's going to be in your plant. And if your plant gets concentrated into an extract, that's going to be in your concentrate at a higher level. Right. It goes same with pesticides, right. same with residual yeah, solvents. Yeah, densifies everything. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, our bodies aren't meant to filter out 
toxins via inhalation. So when you inhale or smoke something, you're bypassing your natural toxicity filters in your liver and kidneys. So, okay, so you bring up a good point. There's a lot of different <laughs> methods and products out there. From a, let's just do safety spectrum really quick so I sure, can freak sure, out a little sure. bit less when I'm uh, consuming <laughs> cannabis. Um, edibles goes through your stomach, a lot of filters down there. I, right. I, I'm mm -hmm. assuming a little bit safer than maybe, maybe not in the heavy metal spectrum, um, but definitely with some of those like the, the, the other chemical compounds that maybe were intended to be consumed but not vaporized. Is, right. Yeah. Because that is happening, right? Where, <laughs> right, yeah. um, it's more dangerous maybe to consume it through vapor, but then maybe as an edible, it's not as, yeah. as worries. I mean, our bodies just metabolize edibles differently anyway. It's a different mm -hmm. kind of uh, medicated state. But um, yeah, I mean, Vu can speak to food. You know, there's so many foods that have X amount of allowable pesticide on it that we're, you know, eating. Yeah. That's in Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, every other market out there because the USDA and the FDA are like, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. So, I mean, I know he's mentioned... Yeah. One, uh, one you know. really big pesticide or herbicide to be uh, to be accurate is called glyphosate or Roundup. Mm -hmm. There's a lot oh. of them. Uh, yeah. they allow I, th I think our like parents and grandparents love that shit. Like, it's all over. It's <laughs> and, and, and it's on over the place right now. If you, you, know, you, eat, the any, if you eat any wheat or grain cheese, cereal, like oats, you're eating it. Mm, in yeah. the high amount. Delicious. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And you know, and that's one of them. And then if yeah. I look emaciated on our next show, we'll know why. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <just> not <laughs> no, no, that'll that'll week. come to bite you in the ass when you're like 50, 60. You right. Know? Then then it's like, oh, where'd this cancer come from? Eh, who knows? It's like, oh, just so the, the best diet ever. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty yeah. pounds yeah. around the, that's, that's the, the there's pilot. the General Mills uh, diet right there. Yeah. Oh. Right. Um, yeah. Awesome. We're gonna get General Mills it <laughs> mad at us now too. Just like just add it to the list. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, Vu, as you as you're testing these products, like which ones are you know are there ones that are failing on a more consistent basis than say others? Like it's. Uh, uh -huh. I had to say that from beginning we found a lot of pesticides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every single time we test for it, uh, we find like microbial no, yeah. uh, by Phenazate. Piperone butoxides, those are very common. Spiromesophen. Uh, right, yeah. spiromesophen. Um, we found it a lot, so much that scared me. Yeah. I mean, 10 ppm, 100 ppm. Parts uh, per million. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, explain that a little bit. To, like, so, well, so I, I, that becomes a major concern, especially like when you're, when you're vaporizing it, right? Yeah. Um, like, well, what's happening when some of these pesticides are being vaporized? And, like, I, I, I have heard of, like, mycobutanol turning into cyanide. Cyanide. Yeah. yeah this sounds yeah. scary. Yeah. Uh, so we don't know, to be honest. I mean, yeah. some of this, we had to look at structure of the chemical. Mm -hmm. And somebody would test it and burn it and see what happened when that got burned. So um, it could turn into something else that's super bad for you. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of terrible because... <laughs> As a result of cannabis being a DEA Schedule I substance, mm -hmm. research can't be done unless you have a grant. And so few people and places have that grant, like University of Mississippi, that the research won't be done fast enough to assess this issue and address yeah. this issue. No, this is th this is something I've spoke about like many times. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. Because the DEA has like refused to remove cannabis from Schedule I, mm -hmm. it has blocked all research yep. and, right. you know, like the just putting in the standards and structure that we need to create like clean medicine. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest tragedy behind all of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, how can you make informed decisions without the information? Right. Um, and unfortunately, this is all, you know, because funding. Mm -hmm. They, If they cut cannabis out of the DEA's budget, there goes like a third, maybe half of their budget mm -hmm. gone. Because, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, the war against drugs has failed, and yep. um, it's looking more like less incarceration and more treatment as an ailment, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I'm sure private prison industry will love. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's just this terrible, terrible situation where people can't research something that can both be super beneficial and super helpful for millions of people around the world, but then also right now poses a huge health risk because not enough lab testing has been done because not enough research has been done and thus nobody really knows what affects people and how. Yeah. Like the Michael Butanil turning into cyanide, you know, that's really just a claim. It's not 
it's totally scientifically proven all of the time, 100% of the time. Interesting. So, okay. I mean, it's kind of a situation where you throw your hands up in the air and you're like, well, am I willing to take this risk in trying products that may or may not be clean or am I willing to shell out money to have everything tested? Mm -hmm. And then there's at least a better chance I know I'm consuming something that won't hurt me in the long run. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, it requires as a, as a consumer that is concerned about it, it requires mm -hmm. you to do like a lot of homework mm -hmm. and just be mm -hmm. like really finding the producers that you trust, the labs that you trust yeah. and kind of maybe sticking with that until the standards are, are more enforced or created mm -hmm. in this case. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, wait, wait. I, I have a question. If you're uh, if you're a producer, do you have advice for them about how to avoid a lot of the common problems and and you know, maybe just talk to how to be a, a good producer? Um, I mean, a couple things off the bat: check your soil, check your water, make sure you're getting those from reputable, legitimate sources, and even test those. I, I would get those tested, and that's not necessarily pushing our business or anyone else's business there's no greater weapon on your side than data. Uh, you know, having data, having information and having knowledge as a result of that is the greatest thing you can do for yourself as a producer of any kind of product, whether it be cannabis or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if you, if you check your soil, check your water, make sure you and or your workers are wearing, you know, uh, latex gloves, face masks, beard masks, hair nets, whatever you want to call it, scrubs. Um, I know I worked in a trim room before I got into the scientific side of things uh, and we were wearing all that stuff daily basis. We switched everything with every strain we touched. We, we, we made sure n there was no con cross contamination within our facility whatsoever. Um, in that respect, I know a lot of growers out there, you know, they've been doing this for generations or for many years. So, you know, they've got their tried and true methods and, you know, whatever they feel comfortable with. But uh, a lot of people out there are touching the flower constant with, constantly with their hands. Yeah. And I know uh, we've had people come into the lab that just reach into a bag of flour and just grab a handful and go, here, test this for me. And it's like, <laughs> you <put it> down. <laughs> just contaminated it. So, I mean, we can't really do microbiology or we still can if you want to pay us, but there's probably going to be a higher count than normally would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got oils on our hands and so that ends up getting on the plant. Um, but yeah, just don't use pesticides. Check your water uh, filters, test your soil, make sure your clones are clean before you actually grow them. I know there have been situations where people buy a clone and then they grow it and they get it tested and there's pesticide on it and they're like, but how is this possible? I never put any pesticide on it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's probably a systemic pesticide from mama plant that right. came and it got into that clone. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And that's something that won't go out for a couple generations at least, um, which is really unfortunate. So that's another fun ball that the state of California gets to juggle uh, where they want to set stringent enough, strict enough regulations and enforcement, uh, but they also don't want to force a lot of producers back into the black market mm -hmm. um, or elsewhere, i.e., you know, Oregon or other states that are medical uh, or even not. Um, I know there was a whole thing with uh, Bang where NBC LA did like an expose. They basically went to a whole bunch of dispensaries, bought like the top selling products and mm -hmm. did their own tests and found that 93% of everything that they picked up was not considered safe to wow, consume. That's One of those companies was Bang. And then after that, I think uh, a whole bunch of cartridges of theirs were found in New York because, you know, <laughs> people are willing to pay a premium in states where they can't get this stuff. Yeah. Right. So. And we all know that cross-state commerce is not allowed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Say that, that is, that is hugely <laughs> illegal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, no, I mean, uh, you know, we've been talking with the Department of Public Health and other governmental organizations, and basically they're concerned about, you know, finding that balance between making it a market that's accessible to producers and consumers can easily get product that they want to yeah. consume from. But they also really want to make sure that, you know, they're not going to have issues that Oregon or Washington had where the labs weren't doing their jobs or there weren't enough labs to meet demand. And thus people had this massive, massive bottleneck yeah. that they couldn't get through to sell their product. Um, and yeah, they've got kind of a tough job on their hands, especially since they don't have many people on their boards that really know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, no one on those boards are producers or have been in this industry longer than a year or two. Right. Um, well, that's actually not fair to say, but um, 
they haven't been in this for long enough to know what they need to know, I think, on all sides of the spectrum. Sure. Um, and so we were pretty excited when CDPH and a couple of other government bodies approached us for advice because uh, they're like, yeah, you guys have been around longer than we have. You know, yeah. Let us know how we should build our lab. What are your SOPs? What do your standards look like? What do you do with your, with your uh, mm -hmm. do you run your standards every day? How do you have your analysts prepped? You know, what do you do for sample prep? And it's, um, no, it's really good that they've reached out to us because I think that's key. key. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I, I'm getting the feeling like there's a lot of smart people in the lab space. They have this desire to, to figure things out and yeah. make it safe. Mm -hmm. And the model has been there long enough. And, and I feel like your business has grown so quickly. Like, I feel like this might be a problem that could be solved. You know, in the grand scheme of things, this might be a blip on the radar. Mm -hmm. And like, we'll find ourselves in this nicely operating, you know, regulated space, but then it's gonna be balanced by the, the, the cost. Yeah. And then like people right. being Absolutely. pushed to the black market. So yeah. at least from a regulated standpoint, do you think this will be something that is solved relatively quickly? Like as regulations roll out? Um, as I understand it, uh, the state of California is gonna come up with their regulations by January 1st. Mm -hmm. Whether that actually happens in the timeline they've promised is still you know, up in the air. Yeah. Um, but I think what they're gonna do is they're gonna set those precedents, you know, sign in that legislation, um, and I mean that legislature, and will retroactively kind of edit, alter, change, uh, make better whatever it is yeah. that needs to be changed as a result of feedback from the industry as a whole. I got you. Um, so I think they're kind of taking the baby steps approach rather than, uh, you know, one giant leap forward or one great step for mankind kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, just simply because they know that, um, you know, California is the fifth largest GDP in the world, got right. tens of millions of people, and it's the largest state in regards to everything except landmass in the United States. Um, so the federal government, California knows, is watching very closely. Mm -hmm. So if California can do it right, that is a huge step for federal legalization, or at least medicalization. Right. Um, if California screws up, that's gonna give Jeff Sessions all that he needs to come and stamp out anything and everything he wants. Um, so I think it's a very, very crucial point for not just the California industry, but the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think depending on how things go over the next 12 to 24 months, that will really dictate, I think, everything else, you know, with the dominoes will, will follow suit if uh, everything goes well here. But if not, you know, we're kind of back into a sticky situation that's almost Nixon-esque. Sure. Great. Um, <laughs> okay. And then just... What's up, Luke? Actually, you got an audience question, question from Capono Curry. Uh, uh, do they believe? Do they believe there is a way to eliminate sampling bias in the testing industry? Yeah, sampling. Oh, bias. Oh yeah, that's so. actually a good one because uh, <laughs> right. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, right now, people come to us with samples. Uh -huh. Next year, the labs, as I understand it, the labs. I mean, as it written as it's written right now in the draft regulations, uh, labs will be responsible for sampling. So we'll have to have samplers that go out and take samples either from production oh, facilities or so from distribution facilities. Okay. So we will actually be in charge of that, much like our FDA testing, right. where mm -hmm. we have samplers go to locations and do a very specific sampling method that mm -hmm. is, um, you know, regulated or imbued by the FDA. Mm -hmm. um, and so next year, starting January 1st, the labs will be in charge of sampling. So the issue with sampling bias that's out there right now will hopefully be gone. But right now, people walk in the door and they give us what right. they give us. Like right. you don't know. You test this and it represents as, all of As you were saying, yeah, yeah, people will come in with the apex of the plant knowing that's gonna have the highest potency out of that whole plant, mm -hmm. probably out of that whole crop. And that's what they get to put on their packaging because as it stands right now, which is unfortunate, higher THC means better money. You yeah. know, it, it, means, it means you can charge higher, it means consumers are gonna want it more because as of right now, uh, most consumers of cannabis think more THC, more CBD is better. Um, so I think there does need to be a re-education or, or really just more information out there and more education for uh, this just general consumers because I personally would rather have a uh, flower or a product that's 16% THC sure. but then has a good balance of all those other cannabinoids and terpenes. And some, I mean, some people uh, hypothesize that that yeah. might kind of fade into the background and become more about the the full spectrum, or, yeah. or at least you know what else is in there that's yeah. kind of created in this 
balanced entourage effect. Um, but it still sounds like that's going to be an evolution. Yeah, um, yeah. Right now, a lot of people look for bang for buck uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, people are bargain hunters. They want the best sure. deal they can get. Um, and so a lot of companies out there brand themselves as, you know, highest potency per gram or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that progression should happen naturally, as you were saying. Um, I think it's kind of like likening um, moonshine with, you know, everything <laughs> sure. else in the industry. Yeah. You know, the highest, highest THC you can get is basically like just doing shots of straight, you know, ethanol mm, or, yeah. or moonshine, whereas, <laughs> you know, a lot of people would prefer a wine or a beer or a cocktail. Um, which has much more uh, uh, terpene involved or flavor involved yeah. uh, profiles that still get the job done, but you know you're not waking up in the hospital the next day having had your stomach pumped. Right. Um, yeah. And so, just to kind of start wrapping things up, you know, sure. a lot of like, you know, there's the flower producers, the growers, and, and that kind of stuff. But then you know, there's a lot of uh, product companies that are just sourcing oils or sourcing yeah. flour and you know what could they really be doing to kind of ensure that they're you know using the best product to create their their food items yeah i know for a lot of larger brands right now the biggest issue they have is supply mm -hmm. clean supply clean supply um and we've been through this with some of our clients where mm -hmm. the first time they come to us the first couple of weeks we find all sorts of pesticides or contaminants and you know we let them know that and then so there's sort of this r d process where they use us as a backboard mm -hmm. to sort of see what is coming from different suppliers so they can kind of audit those yeah. suppliers and then once they find the ones that have consistently clean product they then really integrate them into their uh, process and their supply chain and then at that point it's a question of ironing out any other smaller stuff yeah. um, so I know you know we've seen that with almost every one of our well not almost everyone but some of our we larger clients yeah, yeah right. where they initially come in there's residual solvents or there's some pesticides or there's right. some other issues and then they just end up over time it ends up working itself out because they see those results that are real yeah. and that's the key part is mm -hmm. having real results understanding that a bad result doesn't necessarily mean the world's going to come crumbling down you know it's not chicken little here sure. um, <laughs> so you get a bad result you go back you figure out where is this coming from why is this happening and how can we fix it Mm -hmm. um, that was the thing that was most worrying to me at HempCon, where you know seventy percent of those people that we ended up having disqualified as a result of those lab tests, yeah. basically said, you know, f this, I'll just go back to the lab I get good results at. You know, only twenty or thirty percent were actually concerned or cared enough to approach us and say, why did this happen? How can we avoid this? How can we fix this? Yeah. That, I think, is a mentality that is key to this industry. And I think moving forward, we're going to see a lot of those money grab companies dropping out. Good. Yeah. So standards could create like a culling and then the ones that have been operating cleanly exactly. and diligently. I, I, think, I think the free market will naturally do what it's meant to do. And that's the better products and better um, companies will rise Carter to just the top. in love with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Cannabis capitalism. That's <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah. They go hand in hand. Um, you have uh, you have audience. Questions. Oh, more audience questions. Let's do Great. it. Let's do it. Let's go. I have a quick one. You mentioned that you test for about 382 compounds. 382. Pesticides, yeah. Pesticides. And I'm wondering how that, if you have pricing or packages that appeal to startups and you know young entrepreneurs, uh, you know, to encourage them to actually go with the higher number of testing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, right now, pesticide wise, we're definitely the most expensive lab. It's 200 to $250 per test, depending mm -hmm. on which one you get. Um, basically, what we do is we don't offer packages like the other labs do. I don't like to lock people into a set number of tests with us because if after the first couple of tests, they don't like the results they're seeing or if they decide, you know, we're not the lab for them, I don't want them to be locked into 1500 bucks for 30 tests and they can't get it back because we've had so many people come to us that, you know, basically said, I worked with this lab and I bought all these tests, but after the first two tests, I couldn't trust them. Mm. Um, so we just give, you know, depending on who that 
producer is and what frequency of samples we see over time, um, some sort of rolling discount or some sort of special turnaround time or something mm -hmm. that can help out their process depending on what they value more. Right. So I know with some producers, they pay full price, but they get you know a special turnaround time that's much more in tune with their supply chain and how they work. Uh, other producers don't care. They, they can get the results in you know five to seven days and they're like, just give us the biggest discount you can afford. Um, so in that regard, yeah, we'll just work with clients on a client by client basis, just because I think that's the way to do it. And you and were you you well. were saying sorry, <laughs> I keep forgetting I'm not on air. <laughs> uh, you were saying that um, people use you, and then they might you're worried that they might not be kind of satisfied mm -hmm. or might not be right for you. What should they be looking for in the lab uh, yeah. in terms of make, making that decision? Consistent, accurate, reliable results would probably be the most obvious answer. How, how uh, do they know whether they're accurate? So that's the, that's the thing. You unfortunately can't know. Uh, most labs out there are black boxes. Um, you can't get any answers or any uh, real information from them unless you really push and dig. Um, and that's simply because not enough people do ask them those questions, or maybe too many people are asking them those questions and they're just shutting it all out. Um, I know what I'm trying to do with Enresco is make us a glass house where if anyone has questions, if they want to see the chromatographs, if they want any raw data, we'll just send it to them. Um, and in that respect, I think that builds a really good relationship or a great foundation of trust um, that is I think super, super key when you think of labs as being the gatekeepers to the industry for mm -hmm. these companies. You know, if, if your lab results are poor, you can't sell. You, you can't put that product to market, you're dead in the water. Um, and so I think not just finding a lab that gives you good results, but finding a lab that gives you, quote, you know, real results that are consistent uh, is probably the most crucial thing. Um, and a lot of those people, like I said, that get locked into a package with a given lab and then aren't satisfied, it's usually because they send in the same sample under two different names and end up with a 30% difference in potency. And that's way more than standard error, which mm -hmm. is five, maybe 10%, mm -hmm. depending on what the lab is doing um, for what the industry is paying right now. Um, and you know, I know we've offered our services to clients like doing watered down USP testing for 500, 400, hundred dollars rather than a sixty dollar potency test and most people don't want to stomach that cost for what's considered to be real reliable legitimate testing mm. so it's kind of uh, an interesting marriage that has to be made there yeah wondering if you have a 24-hour turnaround no no uh, that's simply because we are so backed up that our five day five business day turnaround is probably the best we can do. Vu, what are uh, you doing uh, here? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, I, I, that's time. We'd actually say yes, we can yeah. do for one or two clients, yeah, but yeah. you know, in the rest Just of basic, can't offer it on a well, we can, basis. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I no. mean, you know, three days turnaround is still really fast. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you, we need time to work on it. And as Isaac mentioned before, we find something that doesn't look right. We want to go back and rerun yeah. them again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So three days is nothing. Um, because we, it's just like not one sample we're working on. We got tons of samples to work with, right. and so three days still very rushy for us. Though. Yeah. So I mean, our typical turnaround times five business days, give or take, you know, whatever, an afternoon or an evening. Um, but that's because you know these guys are inundated with samples right now, and mm -hmm. we don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. Especially as everybody's ramping up for 2018, they have to get ready for a batch by batch sampling testing. And, and what defines a batch? Right now, we don't know. Oh, okay. uh, state <laughs> regulations aren't out yet, so we won't know until those come out. As of right now, I think tentatively they're calling for flour uh, uh, batch 10 pounds. Okay. So then maybe an ounce or something like that out of that 10 pounds will be considered a sample. So if you're selling $20,000 worth of product, you should be able to afford a $600 test. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, I think most people... Uh, don't want to stomach that cost because they don't understand either the value of having real reliable lab testing or they're just so used to a black market where they produce and go straight to selling. Right. There's no in between, there's no distributor, there's no retailer. It's just, oh, I grew this product, hit me up on Instagram or Craigslist or here's my phone number, mm -hmm. you know, what do you I get two zips, great, here's $400, $800, you know. Right. Um, and that is something that I think will just come with time because we're so 
recently out of this long history of a black market in Northern California where people yeah. are used to avoiding feds and police and raids and, you know, all these other things. Um, I think as things legitimize and become more real uh, business-esque, um, as this industry businessifies, which is totally a word I just made up. It's awesome. We um, do it all the time. I think things will <laughs> iron themselves out in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to keep tangenting and, <laughs> and we have more questions, but really, but really quick. Um, we talked about black market. We talked about the mainstream. What about like the home grower? Like, yeah. I mean, is that, a, is that a concern? I mean, I'm assuming it's a concern. Um, yeah. Though they have control over the pesticides. Um, maybe not as knowledgeable about the soil. Right? Yeah. It, it's a pro and con to it, right? I yeah. mean, you home grow and you in-house, then you get a little bit more control. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, if you grow outside in the backyard, you might have trip effect from your neighbor if they spray the lawn or something. Right. So that yeah. could happen. If you're near a golf course, you are screwed. And that too. Oh, yeah. oh golf and courses yeah. are ridden with them. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 I mean, Stop. how do you think they keep all that? I'm grass not stopping perfect? golfing as well. Great. Um, no, but you're not. You're not. You're not eating that. That. that you don't know the though. way I you're golf. Not, you're not no. eating that. Um, no, I mean, for home growers, it's kind of an interesting issue because, as Vu said, you have way more control and mm -hmm. you know where your product is coming from. But the issue then becomes where are you getting the seeds or the clone mm -hmm. or the cutting from, mm -hmm. and then where are you getting your soil from, and you know where's your water, water coming from. Laundering. And we'll so, if, if 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 a home grower if a home grower is very very vigilant and they do their due diligence. So they'll be fine. They'll be f totally fine. They'll know that they have clean plants in their home for themselves or their family or whoever it's for. Um, but yeah, one thing that's kind of tough is getting tests when you're just growing for yourself. You yeah. know, you don't want to shell out four or five hundred dollars for a gamut of two rounds of testing if you're just giving it to yourself because yeah. that's all that added cost to whatever you're, you're paying already to grow your plant sure. or plants. Um, and so one idea I actually brought up to the San Francisco Small Business Commission is, or committee is um, subsidizing mm -hmm. labs. Because if we can get some costs covered, we can bring those prices down. Let's say they cover the costs of our mass spec triple quads for a yeah. year, which will cost them, uh, I don't know, $200,000 tops then we can just, afford <laughs> to really, yeah. really cut I just got to say, if, if we reach a point in time where, where the, the local governments are subsidizing <coughs> anything involved with the cannabis industry, we will have reached a new level. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. But I mean, it's a public safety issue. It's a public health cool. issue. And yeah. I think regardless of the substance, you know, it's like, saying, you know, for alcohol producers, oh yeah, this is about 50% alcohol. We're not really sure, but you know, that's fine. Could be other stuff in it. It's cool. Could be 90. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea. And I mean, that's what happens with a lot of edibles. People who haven't had an experience with cannabis before, who have had experiences with cannabis before, take an edible thinking it's, you know, gonna be a 10, 15 milligram edible, but if it's a batch of brownies and that brownie was on the end of the tray <laughs> that was a little bit bent and all that oil went there while it was baking, you're you're going to outer space. You're like <laughs> you're out of there. And that can be incredibly overwhelming and just outrageous for folks who aren't used to that or aren't looking for that effect. Mm -hmm. And that's just a result of improper dosing from not having that data that labs can provide. Uh, again, most people just don't want to pay for it. I think a local subsidy, you know, cities can control that would be massive. Mm -hmm. You know, San Francisco or Oakland or Berkeley or Alameda County as a whole, you know, wants to be considered whatever the safest city yeah. or county in we California. Just funnel some of that money from the DEA. And yeah. The uh, hey, uh, that DEA idea. money could yeah. really go to a lot of good places. Um, so I don't know. That's an idea I brought up. They seem to think it was kind of interesting or at least interesting enough to maybe consider. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Princessa, did I, did I miss one over there? I have one question. Once testing occurs and you find unfavorable results, what does California say you have to do with that product? I would imagine you can't go to the next lab and get tested for less. Right now, that's exactly what it is. Uh, unfortunately, if because there's no regulation standardization or enforcement of any kind, because there are no regulations out, uh, people that, let's say, come to us, get an unfavorable result, will then likely just go to a different lab that's happy to print out a piece of paper that has a favorable result because they know happy customers come back. Mm. And so if you know there's a place that's going to print out good results for you, even though you know your product isn't that great, you can still go and sell it. You're going to go there. I mean, unless you have a moral or ethical backbone, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's few, kind of. You do. That's uh. kind of how it is right now, which is very, very unfortunate. Right. Yeah. Well, 
good to know that we're at least working in a positive direction. It yeah, sounds like yeah. we're getting closer. Yeah. And uh, if we can figure it out in California, hopefully that will bleed through to the rest of the states that are legalized. Yeah, and then the world, hopefully. The world. Yeah, we'll see. That's right. Thank you so much for coming on today, guys. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I might be on a severe diet after this, but I, <laughs> I, I do appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank um, you for having us. Yeah, amazing. Um, and I'm like super excited about what you guys are doing, that you're close and that we can send our startups to you. Uh, someone did ask a question earlier about about getting packaged and discount deals. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, I do know we have a close relationship yeah, with you guys. So yeah, we can yeah. definitely work something out. Absolutely. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who's joined us in the peanut gallery today. Um, <laughs> You guys have been great. I appreciate the input, keeping me on the rails. And everyone out there, thank you so much for uh, being a part of what we do every Friday. Again, we're here in Oakland at the Gateway headquarters and the co-working space Gateway Works. Uh, come join us and Michael will give you a discount of some sort. I'm not gonna <laughs> go through all that. Uh, until next Friday, which I think Carter and I will both be on screen together. Ben, at last. how can they get Gateway Office Hours online? Would you like to tell anyone? I don't know where to get it. They're watching. Sorry, is that, not, is that not They're the right not answer? <laughs> that is the wrong answer. <laughs> the wrong answer. <laughs> I've been fired again. Um, yeah, oh.gtwy.co. Uh, YouTube. YouTube. YouTubes. Podcasts. iTunes. For podcasts iTunes. on iTunes. There you Facebook. Go. Google Play. Yeah. yeah. Facebook. All, all, the, the all the things. All the things. All the things. All the, things. All the time. <laughs> Every Friday. Uh, yeah. Have a great weekend. Get tested. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best sign off ever. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Great to meet you. Same here.